Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 13th episode of Drive Through FM for April 2018. Today's going to be a little bit different of a format. We're going to be doing a listener Q&A. As I mentioned in the last episode, uh, I asked for folks to drop me any questions about any topic, and they did, and they dropped them on my Board Game Geek Guild. So uh, the large portion of this episode will be devoted to that. Uh, before I get started with that, though, I just wanted to do a couple of housekeeping type of things. I was, let's see, last week on a podcast called DLC, which stands for Downloadable Content, with uh, host Jeff Kanata and Christian Spicer. It's mostly a video game focused podcast, but they do talk about tabletop games from time to time. And so we kind of ran into each other on Twitter. Jeff was a guest on the Ludology podcast, which if you don't listen to, you 100% should start from episode one and go all the way to today. It's an excellent podcast. I would say maybe my favorite podcast, uh, if not definitely in the top two or three. Uh, Jeff was a guest on there, and I listened to him on there, and then one thing kind of led to another, and so I would jumped on their podcast, and we talked mostly about video games, but we certainly did talk about a couple of board games on there as well. That was a great time. I'll put a link to the episode in the show notes in the description here, but definitely give that a listen if you get some time. I am going to jump in here real quickly and review five games. Uh, I'm not going to do a super in-depth review. I'll just kind of do them pretty quickly just to kind of save time. Uh, after the reviews, I will announce the contest winner from last episode. Uh, the winner will be announced here live, and then I'll notify this person after the episode drops. And again, this is somebody that wins all of the Rising Sun uh, retail boxes, the base game and expansions and all that good stuff. So that'll be fun, and then we'll jump into the Q&A, but let's go ahead and jump into the first of the five reviews now. And this is going to be for the Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. Had a chance to play this several times uh, recently. It's a roll and write game themed after the Castles of Burgundy uh, board game. Uh, what happens is one player rolls two dice. There's a number dice, a D6, and then there's another six-sided die that has some different colors on there. And then all the players will sort of take an action based on what's presented. And what you're doing is circling uh, little... Uh, spaces and hexes on a map not unlike the castles of burgundy board game map and you're doing that and you're filling in areas and then as you sort of fill in the farms and the castles and the mines and all that stuff then you'll sort of activate these little workers special ability things that you can cross off on later turns to allow you to manipulate the dice kind of do double turns and stuff like that and so you're just kind of doing that and it's sort of a race to score a bunch of points and i would say sort of my verdict on it is it's okay it's kind of fun it's a good little sort of time waster kind of thing i do enjoy playing it we've had fun with it uh, playing it at work at lunch and it's pretty good like it's just kind of plays itself a little bit because you're sort of you have to uh circle areas that are adjacent to other areas you, you circled with and there's certainly some decision space some strategy uh some different things to kind of go after in terms of you know you can get these monks which will allow you to change the color die, and then you can get workers, which allow you to change the number die, and a couple of different things like you can get goods and sell them, and it gives you extra points, and it gives you the ore, which then you can spend to take uh, kind of a double turn and so on. So it's pretty fun, but it's not something I would like super recommend and rush out, but it does give you a ton of papers to sort of mark off, and there are different maps and things. So there's, and it's not always the same map, and it gives you a giant pad of them. And I think it's like 15 bucks or so. Uh, so it's definitely worth the money and certainly one that you could break out and play. Like we do, played it at lunch at work. And I had a chance to spend some, a weekend with my brother a couple of weeks ago. And I took it and played with him. And we had a good time. We went to this uh, board game pizza bar place. And uh, we just broke it out there actually at the bar and played a couple of games while we are waiting for pizza and drinks. So it does work for that sort of good, uh, that kind of atmosphere there. So that is the Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. And now the next game is Zombicide Green Horde. Now this is from Simon, And really didn't have a great inclination to play this. I played the original Zombicide uh, however many years ago when it first came out. And kind of liked it for a quick second. And then as I played more and more scenarios, 
uh, the original scenarios were sort of busted and not fun and not balanced and all that. And I think they've come back and sort of FAQ'd that original game to sort of improve that. And then it also had that kind of weird, silly rule, which I kind of liked, but then I didn't really like it in practice where when you were shooting into another space, if you had people on your team, other humans there, then you would actually hit them first and stuff like that. I don't remember the exact rule, but they've taken that out of there. Uh, this Zombicide Green Horde is sort of in the same universe and compatible with Zombicide Black Plague. So it's kind of a medieval, uh, you know, fantasy type of Zombicide. And it's, uh, Green Horde was uh, really fun. I haven't actually played Black Plague, but this is sort of the same uh, rules and sort of idea as Black Plague with a couple of little additions where zombies will sort of, sort of queue up off the board and sort of build this horde up and then a card may come out and then dump a, just a chunk of zombies uh, in this one space where they can spawn. So you have to kind of be wary of that, that things will be going along, but there's that sort of ticking time bomb of a giant horde of them coming out. And then it gives you a catapult, which then you can have to try to race to and use, but it takes up basically all the actions on your turn or most of them. Uh, and then, but it does a high uh, amount of damage and stuff. Uh, played through this a couple of times and it's, it's fun. I mean, it's not, I'm not going to say it's, you know, amazing or anything, but it's fun. I mean, this is a great, like, quick setup, you know, jump all the zombies on the table, set the decks up, and then just go away and play, and really simple and straightforward. And it has some cool choices, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of dice rolling and pushing your luck kind of thing. Uh, but I had a good time with it. I actually got more interested in it because of the zombie miniatures, uh, which are sort of orcs and goblins, but zombies. And I have uh, some death armies for Warhammer, that I use and uh, I don't have any zombies at all because the zombie models for the Warhammer Fantasy Age of Sigmar universe are kind of awful uh, and they're always human you know one thing that's cool about playing Warhammer stuff is you can, you can convert stuff and you know kind of make your own changes uh, although I don't know that I could go into a games workshop store and use these zombies but uh, I like that that they have orc zombies they're not just a bunch of humans because you know there's a bunch of different races in the world and now I've got some orcs and maybe I'll pick up Black Plague and mix in. So I have a, like a good mix of races because, you know, death doesn't just kill humans. It kills everything. So there should be uh, dwarves and orcs and elf zombies and stuff probably. But anyway, so that got me painting it, which I painted up the whole set. And I painted the heroes and everything. And then I was like, I might as well play this. <laughs> so I played it. And it's pretty fun. You know, I would say uh, seven, out, 7 out of 10, something like that. You know, it's not amazing. It's not awesome. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to anybody that was like into Euro games. This isn't going to be a big crossover game, but it's fun. So getting to the top three, the, this is getting to the really good stuff. Uh, the next game, and I got to say, these three games I'm going to mention, I've really kind of struggled because, you know, I've been putting them sort of in order of kind of the ones I didn't like or was less than thrilled about up until the, my kind of my favorite for the last month. Uh, these three, they all kind of juggled them, and uh, I could have put any of these in the top spot, so to speak. So... Anyway, the third one here is uh, Bottle Imp. Now, this is an older game that's now been reprinted by Stronghold Games. And it is a trick-taking game with a twist kind of idea. Uh, this one, I played it a while ago. Some of my friends had it. They got rid of it. And then I picked this one up and uh, had a chance to play it some t uh, at work as well. This is a tricky one to explain. I'll kind of give you the feeling of it first before I talk about any mechanics. So... Uh, the idea and the story of this, which is interesting because the box and the rules mention zero about the story, which is a Robert Louis Stevenson short story called The Bottle Imp, which I just looked up on Wikipedia because I had to remember what it was about. So there's this bottle that you get. Somebody will sell you this bottle and you'll buy it. And then the bottle will make you super rich because it's possessed by, you know, demonic powers. And so you're going to be super wealthy and famous and rich. But the trick is you have to sell off the bottle and be poorer than when you got the bottle. When you do that, or else, then you're going to go to hell and your soul will burn for eternity. So it's kind of this, <laughs> yeah, so there you go. In the game, somehow it's a trick-taking game, but it actually elicits all of that in the trick-taking game. So the mechanics of it is, is everybody gets a hand of cards. You just deal out all the cards. There's three colors of cards. And they're numbered from, let's see, 1 to 37, I want to say. And then the bottle imp, the bottle card, is a 19. And nobody gets dealt that. That's just set in the center of the table, and you put this little wooden bottle on it. 
and then somebody randomly goes first and they lead a card and the colors of cards are sort of weird because most of the red cards are towards the higher spectrum they're higher up and then you have the blue cards which kind of float in the middle down towards the bottom and then the yellow cards are all like the low number cards one two three and then they they kind of start skipping around though so like there'll be a blue four and a yellow 22 but there's no yellow higher than 22 i think that's the highest yellow card so anyway somebody plays a card and everybody has to follow the same color if they don't have any of that color they can play whatever they want now typically whoever plays the highest card no matter the color no matter what was led will take the trick and on those cards are these little like diamonds or stars and those are the points you're going to get at the end of the round. So you might play the 37, and somebody plays some other cards, and you get all of them and count those up at the end of the, the round, and those are the points you get. However, there's one little twist here. If somebody plays a card that is underneath the bottle card, which starts out at 19, like I said. So you play a 37, I play a 24, and then Billy will play an 18. Now that's underneath the 19, obviously. So whoever plays a card underneath the bottle card but closest to it will then take the trick and they'll win so in that case billy plays the 18 he gets our cards our very high number cards with lots of points on them but then he takes also the bottle itself the wooden bottle and he puts it on his 18. so now he has the bottle then we play again and billy will lead and then again highest number will win unless somebody plays a card underneath now an 18 and whoever plays the card closest to the 18 will then take it and get all get all the cards and win the trick and then also take the bottle so the bottle keeps kind of slowly being passed around because you know as the cards sort of shrink and you start playing lower and lower cards and then whoever ends up with the bottle in front of them gets negative points of all the points that they collected so getting the bottle is uh, is you know maybe a good thing to do early in the round because you can sort of collect you know cards and things and break and get some of those higher numbered higher value cards and so on and one other thing you do is you'll actually pass cards to your left and right at the start of each round. So, you know, if you get dealt like all the low cards and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to end up with the bottle no matter what, you can kind of slough them off a little bit. So anyway, it, the whole thing is this like impending doom and dread, especially when you have the bottle. Even when you don't have the bottle and you maybe have some low cards, you're like, okay, I really need to get off rid of all my reds so I can start dumping all these low yellows and sneaking them in when somebody else plays the card to take the bottle early in the round i can get rid of my ones and twos maybe so i know that at the end of the round i'm not just automatically going to get the bottle no matter what happens uh, so it really elicits that feeling of just impending approaching inevitable doom that is going to befall your soul because of these cards that you were dealt you're like i don't even want to buy this bottle i don't want it but it's in my life and then you'll get the bottle and then you'll keep winning tricks. You're like, I don't want to win any more tricks because I know I'm not getting rid of this bottle. So it's just great. Uh, and it really uh, produces a lot of weird, uh, cool play where, uh, you know, the first few times we played it uh, at lunch, I was kind of kicking everybody's butt because I'd played it before. But then they quickly caught on. And uh, and then it's, it's really good. I highly recommend That's an instant pickup, I think, if you like card games at all, trick-taking games, even in the slightest. Uh, give it a few plays, a few rounds, and then you can sort of start to get into the vibe of it. Anyway, that's uh, Bottle Imp from Stronghold. Uh, the next game is another one from Simon. This is Way of the Panda. Now, this is not coming out until the end of May. Uh, it's right around closer to Origins. This one is a, is a bolt of lightning. I had no inclination or clue about this game. Uh, Simon sent me uh, some games here, Zombie Side, Away of the Panda, some others. And I was like, eh, what are, why'd you send me all these games? <laughs> Zombie Side, I don't really like that. I ended up playing that, painting it. And then I looked through the rules of some of the others, and the rules that struck out to me the most was Way of the Panda after I read it. I was like, hmm, this looks interesting. So I brought it to game night uh, the other night. We played it back to back. As you can tell, we liked it. Um, it's really, uh, it's sort of deceiving because it has these little cute panda miniatures and each player gets like these three panda champions, a monk, a warrior and stuff. And then you have these little tiny pandas that are sort of like your workers. They're called guards, but they're like little worker placement type things. You put them on these action spaces and then also on this kind of giant map, uh, they sort of like take over territory and you, uh, you sort of take control of different routes so the theme of it is some like ninja panda clan or something 
came over and like wiped out all the kingdoms. And then each of the players is trying to kind of slowly reestablish uh, each of their kingdoms. And the sort of the hook of the game, I'll just kind of explain that because doing the mechanics of this would be really involved. Um, so what you, there's like a sort of a action board and then there's the map. So the map has these little cities and trails and things that you're trying to sort of cover up these little ninjas that are on all the trails. And then you can build certain buildings like each of your champions, then the warrior and the monk, they're sort of responsible for certain types of actions. So the warrior can build uh, the pagoda and then they do, they get like little warrior items and they go on warrior quests and things, which are just like collecting little tokens and the monks do theirs and so on. And then there's that giant action board, which if you've played a feast for Odin, it sort of looks like that where you have sort of rows and columns of actions. It doesn't play anything like it, but think about it, it's just this giant board with all these different action spaces that you can take. But there's a uh, sort of a uh, handcuffs on you in the order in the, the way you're going to approach those actions. So if you kind of look at it, you're, you're looking at it and you go, okay, I'm starting in the upper left and then kind of reading left to right, top to bottom. Because if you take an action, let's say, in the second row, you go down two rows and then you kind of move over a little bit and say, take the one in the second column. So you put your guy down there and then you take the action, which might be to move one of your champions or collect an item or build a building or something like that. But now you've locked out everything above that. So you can't do anything now in the first row and you can't do anything directly to the left of it. So in the second row in the first column, you can't do that. So you can only do stuff to the right of it and below it. And so then your next action will be somewhere and then that will lock out everything above it and then directly to the left of it. But you can always do anything to the right of it directly or anything underneath it, no matter which uh, row or column it's in. As long as you go underneath, you can do whatever. So you're sort of slowly reducing the amount of actions that you can do. And then any actions that are towards the bottom are going to actually going to cost you action points. So there's like a little action point tracker. And then at the end of the round, you're going to pull off those guards, those little workers, and then you're going to get that many action points back. So there's an interesting thing, though. The first player to place in a spot will place one worker. Then the next player to place there, which could be you again, because you can always place in the same spot, is to put two workers down. And then the third person to place to place three workers. So you might go to a spot that maybe costs zero or one actually action point, but actually put three guys down there. And then again, when you pull them off, then you're going to get an action point per guy. So there's a kind of weird little combos and stuff, and some places will give you bonus action points and stuff like that. So you're doing these, and so the idea, though, is that you're taking all these actions on the map and building, uh, dropping out those same workers that you're using for the worker placement. You Sometimes it will be a cost that you actually put and move your champion and then sort of drop off a worker to sort of take start to take control of those rows that the ninjas are on. And then once they get fully covered up, those workers will come back to you off of the map and then you'll put like a little cardboard token to show that, you know, so-and-so controls that road. So it's a real balance between having enough workers to do the actions you want and then keeping workers back to sort of take control over the board itself. And then you can start to build buildings and you score points for surrounding cities and completing cities. Uh, each city can only have one of the certain, there's three types of building, one for each of the champions that you get. And then you'll build a city and then you can get these cool little like bases and then rebuild the city a second time, which then it becomes a capital. And there's all kinds of ways to score points and stuff like that. This is a giant, massive brain burner of a game. Uh, this is, this is heavy. I mean, it's, it's definitely medium heavy, if not heavy. I mean, depending on your definition of heavy, you know, some people's heavy is like Twilight Imperium and 18XX. I'm like, okay, well that's the heaviest things ever. So let's pull back to like Vinos or Madeira or something. It's not quite that level of heavy up to like a, you know, Vital Lacerda game or something. Uh, but it's certainly around like an Age of Steam or something. Um, because every, especially the second time we played, every time I was doing something, I was like, I'd do something. And then the turn would kind of come back to me. And I was like, man, I could have done like eight other things. <laughs> that might have been better than that. But then you're like, well, I don't know. It kind of depends what everybody else does. So there's this whole, it's just like super, there's lots of layers here, I think. I've only played it twice, but this is one that everybody that played it at, at the game night was really into uh, into playing again and really just chewing through it and just saying like, oh, can we start over? You know, because after you play a couple of turns, you kind of see how things work out and everything. Uh, there, I did have one rules question, which I put into CMON. There's like these bonus city spaces that are like on the edge of the board. 
uh, they were very interesting. I don't want to get into that, but just uh, there was that rule and then one other rule that I, we sort of messed up the first time uh, we played. But that's just because I was dumb, not because of the problem with the rule book. But it is sort of unclear. There's these like three bonus action spaces. And me and my buddy, we were reading it back and forth to each other after uh, the game night was over. And we're like, yeah, I don't know how this is supposed to work. <laughs> you could either read it one way or the other. But I don't think it's that game breaking, but we did figure out a way that you could exploit it. And if the rules are, if we're reading it that way, then it's not really a problem. It's just you have to know that because then you can take actions to prevent it. So that's just a sort of a small caveat there. Um, but yeah, so this is a really good, cool game. Uh, definitely check it out when it drops. And don't be like thinking this is going to be some fluffy Euro with cool pandas like uh, Takinoko or something or anything like that. It's a, it's a beast. It's definitely a beast. Uh, that's Way of the Panda. And the last game, and I think this is definitely my number one here so far, and this is called A Fog of Love. Now, this came out on Kickstarter, I think, last year. Now it's finally starting to get out into uh, retail. Now, it's a, I think it's only a Walmart exclusive for a little bit of time now, so the only place you can get it is, uh, I think, either on their website or going into the store. And I've had a chance to play this uh, with my wife. We played it a few times now, and we both absolutely love it. Uh, it's it's a crazy, amazing game. I was sort of, I heard of it, and I was like, yeah, okay, it seems all right. It, it just seemed kind of, you know, not much going on. But after getting it, reading the rules and everything, I started to get more into it, and then we played it a few times. And this is one you have to really approach with a kind of a, a role-playing attitude. Uh, the mechanics are there. There are mechanics for sort of playing cards and, and sort of doing like a hand management kind of thing. And the rules themselves tell you to come at this with a, a role-playing uh, type of vibe. So what, what you do is you're in a relationship. It's a two-player game. And each player will get these traits uh, that are hidden. The other player won't know what they are, but they're kind of like your sort of end game goals. Uh, and they'll track sort of like personality traits. And you'll put these tokens on the board to kind of track where you're at. And so the engine of the game is driven by playing these cards and then each player will make a decision. So I may play a card like, where do you want to go for dinner tonight? And then we'll both pick secretly with these chips and then reveal. Now, if we match, usually on most of the cards, you'll get like bonus victory points they're called satisfaction points. And so that's kind of like your overall victory points. But you also want to look at the card that asked you about going to the restaurant and that's going to, based on your decision, that's going to then uh, change your sort of personality traits. And so you want to also make decisions based on your hidden sort of goals just to kind of, you know, be true to the person that you are. So as you're kind of setting up the game and, and uh, creating your characters, uh, you'll, you'll explain to each other. I won't tell somebody that, like, I'm clumsy or selfish, but... Uh, you'll sort of explain about your your character and you want to kind of do it in a way that maybe hints to them, you know, who you are and what your traits might be. So again, you get into this kind of role-playing thing. And then the other thing that you're going to do during character creation is you're going to get these features cards and you get each get dealt five and then you're actually going to play them on each other. And what these are going to be are sort of like your first impressions, that first glance, that kind of thing where you when you first notice somebody, so if you notice that somebody has like very nice eyes or something, you'll you'll play that to them. And then that will sort of uh, change uh, one of their little personality traits on the board. But that kind of is an interesting sort of starter because, you know, you, you can't, you, stepping back into real life now, you don't get to decide what people notice about you. I mean, you can take measures to do that. You can dress a certain way and all that kind of stuff. But you really don't have control over what somebody else is going to notice and gravitate towards. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing about that game where I'm playing this like, I noticed this about you, about you. Now, it, it, I should just stress, I don't think I've done that yet, that you're not playing yourselves. You're creating these roles in these different characters. And this is where the game really shines uh, for both of us, frankly. Uh, because, so we played a couple of times and <laughs> there was one time when we had like some really weird characters that like I don't feel comfortable talking about on the on the internet because if we got really into our sort of br we should have a very brutal kind of sense of humor <laughs> so it was like holy cow that relationship needless to say went off the rails and was <laughs> doomed from the beginning but it was fun to kind of play through uh those different scenarios and that's kind of the thing we had fun with was sort of setting up situations to either put our character in 
or put the relationship as a whole in or put the other character in and kind of seeing how they would react and just really kind of driving the the narrative uh through that and just really having a great time with it um and i definitely think you could play this with somebody that you weren't necessarily in a relationship with but the we had a lot of fun with it because i mean we've been married for almost 13 years now so you know we've been together for a long time so uh you know we were very easily able to get into this and sort of uh, role play and 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 sort of just have a lot of fun with it and the thing is the game says a romantic comedy uh board game so i think if you go into it with that attitude is you're sort of creating these situations and stuff and i like the mechanics of it with the card play there's some cards that you can kind of react you get these destiny cards which are sort of like your your general overall goal like are you going to break up are you going to be a dominating personality in the relationship are you going to try to split everything 50 50 and so you're trying to go and target those but we found that we sort of we sort of don't pay that that much attention to the cards and the situations that come up but just enough to kind of keep it on the rails and sort of stay true to your character so instead of just being sort of like freeform storytelling and like a more open-ended role-playing situation the cards and the mechanics and the, the traits and all those personality things are there just to kind of keep it on the rails it's like okay well if i do that that's really not true to me and you can kind of instantly see that in the iconography and everything and say okay well no i wouldn't do that because that's really uh, that's more uh caring than my character should actually be so that kind of stuff really helps to keep it on the rails and the other thing that's really nice about the game the component quality and the art and everything that's kind of the graphic design more than anything is really cool and then you have this tutorial thing uh, so i read the rules pretty generally but then you set up the game and you set up all the decks of cards and it says tutorial card number one so you just flip that over you start reading it and it'll say draw the next six cards out of this deck and deal them out okay once you're done with that flip over tutorial card number two which happens to be the seventh card you know in the deck and then you go to the deck the next deck and flip over that card so once you've flipped over all the decks then you're in you're playing and you're going and that was a great way to sort of uh teach us both the game uh so that was that worked really really well i was very surprised how well that tutorial step-by-step thing uh, worked out so really good i highly recommend this game i mean it's not really going to be for everybody but if you have a partner or just a friend that wouldn't mind playing this kind of thing with you then you know go for it i mean there is going to be there's definitely like sexual situations and uh there's all kinds of situations in here i mean there's some that it can get kind of dark or get kind of different and it might uh you know I don't know. I, it's hard for me to say how people react because I'm kind of whatever. But, but uh, you know, there might be situations that you might not feel comfortable with. I don't know why, but I think other people, sometimes some people wouldn't feel comfortable. So just know that going in. But it, it doesn't really pull any punches, though, which is cool. I really like that. Um, and it's definitely not like a gender-specific thing. Either you could have two same-sex people in there as well because you can kind of flip the card. Um, you know, however you want it to be. And all of the um, the language and kind of the coding of the cards could be read a bunch of different ways too. So it's definitely not, you know, skewed in a sort of certain way. So I thought that was cool too. So that is uh, Fog of Love. Definitely recommend that. This is, this is really, uh, you know, one of the better games I've played this year. Just a breath of fresh air, frankly. Um, and something relatively daring and... Uh, innovative and evocative and uh, something that my wife and I are definitely looking forward to playing a lot more of. So let's take a small break and then I'll come back and announce the contest winner and then we're going to get into the Q and A. Okay, welcome back. And now we're going to announce the contest winner for the Rising Sun package with the base game and the expansions and the extra monster pack and all that good stuff. And the winner is Andrew Miller. And your username on BGG is MillerAJ001. And I will be sending you a geek mail here shortly after I release the podcast. Or you can send me one if I don't get to you first. And uh, then I'll get your shipping details and get all that out to you as soon as I can. So congratulations, Andrew. And thanks for everybody that participated and listens and uh, asked me all these questions that we're about to answer. So congratulations again. And let's jump into the Q&A. 
And I have a fair bit of questions. I think I can get through most of these. We'll kind of watch the time here. And then anything that's left over, I maybe will save for a later one. And we'll see how it goes. So the first question I've got here is, now that you are more interested in miniature heavy games like Necromunda and Warhammer, do you regret getting rid of uh, Kingdom Death Monster? Um, no. <laughs> I don't regret getting rid of it. Uh, I think there are certain times when I want to play it. Uh, part of the reason I got rid of it was that uh, I kind of felt like it could be a good civilization game, uh, maybe without all the horror, although I did like all the horror and the existential dread and all that kind of cool stuff. It was really neat. But it sort of hits the same vibe as Shadows of Brimstone, which our group has been playing a fair bit of. We haven't played it in a few months, though. Uh, but at the time, we were certainly breaking out and playing it. And that just is an easier game to kind of pick up and play and just have fun with it. And it's a little bit more wacky and just off the rails. And there's just, you know, lots of craziness that can happen. And there's just a lot more uh, sort of different paths and stuff that you can take. You can play it in a lot of different ways. Uh, you can go out and dungeon crawls. You can kind of play in town. And uh, it's that, that whole phase has got like its own thing. So it's it's kind of that same idea as Kingdom Death. You go out on like a hunt in Kingdom Death and you come back and have to kind of manage your little tribe or your civilization. Uh, so that's kind of the reason I got rid of it. And it's just, you know, like you said, I'm getting more into the Warhammer side of stuff and uh, Frostgrave and Necromunda. And so that's kind of, you know, getting my fix as well. Um, so, yeah, there's not really any regret there, although I would I would play it again if somebody had it and wanted to play it. And the next question is sort of a follow-up to that, I think, is uh, now that I started to like assembling and painting miniatures, has my taste in board games changed? I don't think so. I mean, I still like playing Euro games, for sure. I mean, I still like playing Kalis. Uh, Fog of Love is one, you know, like I just mentioned a few minutes ago. I love that. Rising Sun. Uh, Lords of Hellas has been fun to play. Uh, you know, I still like uh, like Bottle Imp. I love that kind of stuff. Gosh, I could probably sit down and worry about why people like certain games or something. I don't know. Because some people seem to like, like they like Euros or they like train games or they only play Warhammer 40K and that's the only thing they do. Or they only play Magic or they only like playing 4X games or Ameritrash games or something. And I don't know. I don't... I don't I like I don't understand that and I think they probably don't understand why I can play Kalis and Eldritch Horror and Death Watch Overkill and Forbidden Island and Pandemic and you know Spirit Island and Fleet and San Juan and Race for the Galaxy and Warhammer and I mean I don't really look for a certain thing I just kind of look for a thing that I enjoy and I think is good I don't know it's such a strange thing. It's like music, right? I've, I think I've said this before. As people like certain kinds of music and things, and I, I, I'm the same way with music. I will listen to Public Enemy, and I will get down deep and rock out to that, and I will listen to, I don't know, Nirvana, and I will listen to Pearl Jam, and I will listen to Bob Dylan, and I will listen to some new stuff. Let me think of some new stuff. Uh, Charlotte Gainsborough. LCD sound system, you know, Led Zeppelin going back to that stuff. I mean, I listen to Led Zeppelin and I'll listen to the Sex Pistols, you know, like, uh, I don't know, I got nothing to like, like, I don't really identify myself with music. Like, I don't, I don't derive my identity out of music or out of games or out of movies or anything. I'm definitely more into it's telling me a story like these people the games and movies the musicians they have a story they have a life thing that they're trying to tell me or it may not even be personal it may just be a story they came up with i mean like bob dylan's great at that he comes up with this all these stories and it's like i think some of this stuff happened to him in a, in a certain way but i think he took it and ran with it and created up these characters and made these stories out of it and dylan is probably one of my favorites if ever, ever. So I like, I always kind of come at things like that. Like you're telling me a story. I'm coming to listen to a story. I'm not sort of hitching my wagon to stuff. And I think when I was younger, I did that. And I think a lot of people do Like you listen to music and this is the kind of person you are, is the kind of music that you listen to. And this is my tribe and this is who I'm with and all that. And pretty early on in high school and college, you know, and I had discussions with people about this. And I think everybody kind of goes through the same thing. It's like, yeah, I'm not really in your tribe here, buddy. I'm just listening to your story. And uh, I like your story. It's a good story. It's, it's interesting. It's entertaining. It's funny. It's scary. It makes me think, you know, all that stuff. And so that's, I kind of look at it like that. Like, this is a story in a world that I'm listening and I'm into. 
Anyway, that was a long-winded answer, so maybe we won't get through all these. Let's see, next question. Oh, this is a good one here. It says, Gloomhaven ruined other board games for me for a period of time. That's all I wanted to play. I'm slowly going back to other stuff. Have there been any games that you can think of that left that kind of impression where you did not want to play anything else? Gloomhaven is the only one for me so far. Uh, let's see. I would say definitely the miniature stuff has done that to me. I get in this thing. I was in this phase of for Frostgrave for a while. That's the only thing I wanted to play was Frostgrave. And now I'm kind of in this sort of Age of Sigmar thing where that's all I want to play is Age of Sigmar. But I think that's a little different because that's more of a kind of a lifestyle game where you want to just paint up the miniatures and build your armies and, and do that stuff and just read the lore and kind of get really steeped in it. And so they, I think by nature, those kind of take take that sort of time out of you. Other than that, though, I mean, I can't think of anything that I wanted to do that. I mean, I remember back in the day uh, when I got Kalis and I was going to my board game friend's house there. Uh, we used to play, man, I didn't like it, Princes of Florence all the friggin' time. And they always wanted to play that. And I, I mean, I liked it for a little bit, I think, but I just remember not liking it, like looking back. Um, and then we got Kalis and we played that a lot. Like we played it three times in one night. Um, and then, you know, after that, we, you know, we, we chilled out and we played it once. Uh, but, you know, things back then, there wasn't like so many games and, you know, I wasn't a reviewer or any, even thinking about that. Um, so I think that can happen with a game group where you get it and then you just want to play, 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 play. But nowadays, like so many games, I mean, Gen Con will come out and there'll be like 50 games I want to try. It's just like at least try or look at or read the rules to. But, you know, back in what well, this would have been 2005 or six that many games didn't come out so you'd be like okay that game's coming out i can go we can go buy that next month because there probably won't be any other, other game that we're interested in or something um so yeah other than you know the miniature stuff because it's so time consuming uh, just whatever kind of new and hot and and is really really good you know it's like i want to play that again but it doesn't really take over for months and months uh, like Gloomhaven did. And that's one of the reasons I kind of just put Gloomhaven away because I was like, I just want to play this. <laughs> and I don't, I really don't want to just play this, but that's all I'm going to play. All right. And then next question says, any thoughts on the addiction aspect of board games, acquisition disorder, collecting, or do you think there is any of that in board games? I imagine some are worse than others, but just some thoughts about that, including whether you think you have a bit of it going on. Um, yeah, 100%. I think there's always a, a fence you kind of straddle with probably everything in life. I think I think there's certain personalities, that, you know, they call addictive personalities that will get addicted to things. Um, and you kind of see them sort of transfer that. They may jump addictions, but they sort of, they kind of go whole hog into something. And then maybe they'll burn out on it and then go whole hog into something else. I would say I do have that personality um, for sure. Yeah, that gets, yeah, I think that's a personal thing. That's, it gets pretty psychological. Let's just say that. Um, I, do, I do think that happens. I think it can happen to anybody. And I think just anybody that may have an addictive personality in other things and then they get into board gaming, they'll still have that. So that's just how it'll be. But other people that don't really have that, you know, won't get as addicted to it. And I think people go through phases as well, because the one thing I'll say about uh, board gaming and just kind of gaming in general, it seems that like when you discover it, you can certainly, when you first discover it, you know, when you first get into it, it's like, holy cow, look at all this craziness. I never knew this existed. Um, and that's something that I still, I still kind of go back to in my mind is the first time I played Kalis or Lone Hers or Catan or whatever the game is for you that really... Uh, pulled you in because you know you play games and I, you know I played a couple other games before uh, Lone Hers was the first one I really was like holy cow what what are games games are doing things that you know I don't know what I didn't expect them to do I expect them to be kind of boring you know but I wasn't bored at all when I played that and then later on with Kalis again and Power Grid and um, and then I remember being really addicted to Ascension when that first came out so I think that discovery that sort of first hit that adrenaline a rush of sort of figuring out mechanics and figuring out, oh, if I manipulate these cards and these tokens and these models or whatever in a certain way, I can see something I've planned and tried to uh, to accomplish. So I can see my goal kind of come to fruition. So I think 
that in itself can engender uh, addiction, frankly, because you're like, oh, things work out for me when I do these things. Where sometimes, not to get too heavy, but it's like sometimes in life, it's like, oh, I plan this thing and I plan to do this thing and it didn't work out because of random things or whatever, just bad luck or bad environments or whatever. So I think games kind of will trigger a lot of those same sensors that, you know, people will go, oh, I did this hit of a thing and it made my brain go zip and then <laughs> and then you get into it. So that's kind of that. Uh, following along, uh, where would you prioritize uh, board games in your life? I don't know. Um, that's a great question. I certainly would not prioritize it above family, work, friends, uh, eating, stuff like that. It kind of falls down into where would you prioritize music in your life? And I would say out of like leisure hobby things, music's still pretty high. Um, it's probably, it's an easier, it's an easier consume than a game because there's no rules. I just push play and random on YouTube or my iPod or whatever. And so it comes and goes, comes and goes as I want it. Um, so I think games are around that. I mean, games are higher than that, but, uh, I don't know. It's just, where would you prioritize anything that doesn't, isn't a necessity? Um, I do think in terms of the priority of that. So let's throw out the kind of the obvious, like I said, the family and the friends and the work and survival and all that thing. I think for me personally, I've sort of prioritized, um, I don't, I wouldn't say prioritized fun, uh, prioritized free time, I guess, in a way that is sort of, uh, what do they call it? Self care kind of thing. Cause I think, this is getting deep now. <laughs> so if you lived in uh, some place in the world that was uh, bombed frequently, you know, let's say Syria, for example, or some, just picking that out, not to pick on anybody in Syria, but let's say you live somewhere like that, or you were in London in World War II and you're being bombed, would you still prioritize free time and play? I think you'd certainly try to, for sure. And I think that would be an important thing. Uh, because otherwise you would just be, you know, it keep, keep, would keep you sane, so to speak, to do that. There can be a line that you can cross where you sort of say, I've got to prioritize, you can kind of overdo it. And it kind of falls back into the addiction question where you're like, okay, I, d I deserve the right to establish this moment of self-care and fun and play. And yeah, you do, but you just have to kind of watch it. You know, you have to sort of, you know, take a deep breath and everybody can kind of overdo things. That's fine. That doesn't mean you're going to overdo them forever overdo the thing and realize that you've overdone it and then pull back on it and say to yourself, okay, I got a little too crazy with that. Let's, you know, let's kind of reestablish priorities. That's something you kind of, I think it's a constant process that you do, but I think it is important for people, however they can, anybody, I don't care if you're the richest person on this world or the poorest person on this world, you got to try to take time to prioritize some, some free time and some self time and some, some companionship as well with other people. So I think it just falls into that whole thing. And frankly, for me, uh, I mean, the podcasting and the video stuff is also part of that. Uh, I think there's a certain like uh, creative side too as well. Like you know, a lot of people will paint for a hobby or even a career. Uh, some people will design games. Some people will talk about games or do videos. Uh, and the doing the video part of it, that's kind of its own creative outlet or painting the miniatures and that kind of stuff. So that kind of falls into it. I've kind of been somebody that they're – as far as the creativity and the play side, like my hands have to be busy, you know, um, that's sort of just a itch that I've had as far as I can remember where I'd want to just be doing th something with my hands. So it comes into that as well. Let's see. The next one is when you play games, how much are you thinking with your content creator hat versus just enjoying the games? Do you feel differently now when playing games now that you create content versus when you didn't? Um, I would say they're kind of the same person. I will say, I mean, I've said this before. I, I started doing the videos and the podcasts and stuff uh, because I wanted to sort of dunk myself in the tank and say, let me figure out how these work. Because getting back to that first sort of shock of, oh, wow, these are awesome. What happened to me? I don't understand this. And sort of being able to kind of talk through it, I think that was just, uh, that was just, cause it's kind of part of it. And I just wanted to sort of piece through it and figure it out. But yeah, that's, I think that's the same because I just want to talk through it and then this just gives me a place to do it where I'm not like irritating the heck out of everybody around me and talking about the game. Like, dude, shut up about the game. We've been here for two hours, you know? 
<laughs> it was fun. I'm going to bed. You know, I'm the one that wants to keep talking about it. And next one is when you think of spending money in the hobby, do you focus more on content creation upgrades or gains? Um, I'm not sure what that, I think it just, I'm like upgrading your camera and your mic and stuff. Uh, definitely I would say games. Um, I think I'm pretty well upgraded. I think for now, I think if I were to try to upgrade any more, then this would 100% be, have to be my full-time job because, I mean, I have a decent camera and a decent mic and lighting and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> if I upgrade any more, I better be doing this for a living because I'd be buying some real expensive stuff. Uh, so definitely games there. And then next question, anything you have in mind for future of your content? Oh, I got a lot of things in mind. I almost don't want to say because I'm not sure. I've, that's the problem is I have a lot of things in mind and I want to say what all of them are, but I don't know that I would do two of them, let alone all like 15 of them. Uh, yeah, so it's just a matter of time and stuff. It's a matter of prioritizing, right? Uh, you know, what I do. If I didn't have a job, then I would, or, well, if this was my job, if I didn't have a job, I'd be looking for another job, A. But if this was my job, then it would be completely... A different world for sure anyway so let's see next question is any excitement for the final eminent domain expansion yes I have it here I haven't played it yet but I definitely want to I still have to play the last expansion I didn't get around to playing the last expansion which I have uh, I've only played the first uh, first two expansions I think I don't know I've lost count but yes I'm definitely excited to throw all that in there although it's kind of beginning becoming to the point where there's a ton of stuff so I almost want to just play the base game now but Definitely interested to see what it adds. So how often do you revisit your ratings for games? Um, not like intentionally, I don't go back through, but if I'm going and like rating something and I notice a rating on a game, I'll, I'll just kind of scan and look and be like, oh, there's that. And I'm like, oh, why did I give that a six? That's a four or that's an eight or something. Uh, sometimes, you know, you play a game, uh, you know, a couple months later, a year later and, and you go, oh, this is, this is better than I remember or not as good. And I don't typically like run back and then change the rating because I'm not really, I don't really think about the ratings. I just kind of do it like when I do a video uh, as I'm sort of uploading it to Board Game Geek, I'll go and rate it just to, you know, just because I'm doing it, I'm there on the game page and I'll just rate it then. But I don't typically go back that much and adjust. Uh, next is what is your favorite game publisher or any of them that seem to cater to your tastes? Ooh, I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, I like most of them. Uh, you know, I like most of the stuff like Simon and Stronghold and Fantasy Flight and uh, Rio Grande's put out and, you know, Games Workshop puts out good stuff now. Uh, I would say right now, my favorite publisher has got to be Osprey Games. Uh, I, you know, I've kicked around this idea of just doing a video or something just on their stuff because I have, let's, let me count. I'm looking at them now. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, if you count those. 16 of their books, and then a handful of their board games like uh, London, and I'm looking at my shelf, I can't see anything else. What else do I have from them? Well, I got rid of Escape the Aliens from Outer Space because my friend, uh, we'll call him Billy, <laughs> has it. Um, but yeah, so I like a lot of the games, the board games and the card games they put out. And they put out these great books for miniatures that you probably already have. And they give you another way to kind of use those same pieces that you have. And they've been doing a really good job, though, on the board game and the card game side uh, for the most part. My, I haven't liked every single thing they put out, uh, but they're kind of new up and coming in this in this world. Uh, they've got that new Martin Wallace game that's coming out in like a year or so. Uh, yeah, so definitely looking forward to whatever they put out. I would say outside of your normal sort of, yeah, Fantasy Flight and Simon put out good stuff and, you know, uh, Hans and Gluck and those guys too. I'd say Osprey is definitely one to look out for. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, any particularly good albums you've been listening to lately? Uh, who, what were you say are your three favorite musicians, bands, and artists? Well, let's see. New stuff, I would say Charlotte Gainsborough. Uh, she's sort of a, I don't know what the heck kind of music. I mean, as much as I don't like calling games <laughs> in certain categories, music is even worse. Uh, Charlotte Gainsborough, she's sort of a French post-punk. Well, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Electronic kind of stuff. I like that album a lot. And the new LCD Sound System album I really enjoyed. I've been listening to a lot of Zeppelin recently. 
so that's good. But uh, I think my three favorites, well, I'd say Bob Dylan is up there because uh, he's, he's a chameleon. He changes. I know his voice is shot now. Um, I like him because he changes and he's a chameleon. He never, like, stuck in any box. You know, he was a folk artist and he was an electric folk and rock. And then he switched back to sort of this... 70s songwriting style and then he did like a the born again phase which was weird but his songs were really good and then in the 80s he kind of sucked and then um the 90s he kind of made like a little bit of a, a comeback had some good producers and stuff i think and then uh you know he he, he was good he, he got some some good albums there in the late late 90s and early 2000s and stuff like that i just like him because he tells good stories that's all he just tells really good stories and he creates cool characters and all that stuff. That's why I listen to his music. I would say Pearl Jam is probably up there. Uh, I know it's probably cliche with them, but he's they sort of saved me in some ways. I know that's kind of heavy, but um, yeah, I think I think that's good. Like like they make me feel like I'm not gonna die, sort of. I mean, not. I mean, I know I will, obviously, but like nothing, nothing will kill me. Nothing will like erase me when I listen to their music. I know mean, that's strange, but their their music and their their songs and and Eddie Vedder's lyrics and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I think it had a profound influence on my thinking. That's all. Um, so yeah, Pearl Jam's good. Um, Prince, I like Prince a lot. Um, yeah, I've liked most of his albums. I would say. 80% of them. Uh, he's he's an amazing guitarist. You know, uh, he doesn't really get a lot of credit for being just a good, like, you know, melodic solo guitarist, that kind of stuff. Uh, he's amazing. He's probably the best guitarist that's ever lived, I think. Uh, and his lyrics are really cool. I like his, I like his, I like the style and everything. And, and he's sort of, he kind of remind me of Dylan a little bit where he's sort of just you know, he a little bit reclusive and he wants, he goes off and he does his thing and he comes back and he's just got some really new funky thing. And that's kind of Dylan's thing too. And Prince is just a lot of funkiness to it. And I, I really like that when there's some funk and just a good rhythm and a beat and some good, you know, good vibes and stuff like that coming out. Um, yeah, if I had to pick the top three though, but there's a whole less mess of people I'd throw in there. Zeppelin, I've been back into, uh, their drummer's really good. <laughs> He's amazing. He's like the whole band. He's so good. Um, but yeah, music, like I said, it's a hard time saying your favorites. You know, I've got Dylan and Pearl Jam right up there and Prince. Yeah, I like Tom Petty and stuff like that. That's good too. I can just talk forever because I like, this is a mood, you know, like I'll listen to the Blade Runner 2049 soundtrack. Well, we're close to an hour. Let's see. There's a handful of questions here. I guess a few. I'll just keep going here. Oh, this is a heavy one. All right, well, let's do this. This is a long one. Let me just read this to you, and I'll try to answer it. It says, You discussed that reviewers don't get paid for the reviews, and they are not in the publisher's pocket. I completely agree with your assessment and find these worries regarding reviewer integrity exaggerated. At the same time, there is one practice I find iffy. Going to publisher-organized conventions and providing coverage in return. The Dice Tower and Shut Up and Sit Down have been doing this in recent years, where certain richer publishers, Simon, Plan B Games, Asmodee, fly them to their local conventions, paying all their expenses, I assume. In a hobby where games are flooding the market, media exposure can be key to a game's success, and these bigger publishers can afford to build up hype through buying media attention. Okay. Again, I am not concerned about reviewers not being truthful, but about providing certain publishers increased coverage to the detriment of others. What do you think about this? Do you think it's problematic? Hmm. I would say on first reading, I would say yes, of course, because they're you know doing it for somebody and not for somebody else. However, I will also say I do not think the amount of time, I'm going to sound like a lawyer here, the amount of time that it takes them to provide that coverage is significant enough to make a significant impact. Uh, you know, because it's it's these publishers like the C I don't know, I didn't know there was an Asmodee and Plan B convention. I hadn't heard of those. Uh, the CMON one I do know about because I know a lot of people that have gone to that. I don't think taking that you know half a week of time and then doing some videos or any kind of articles about that is really holding back coverage of somebody else. 
I think there's plenty of time in the year, so to speak, to cover all the games. And I don't think enough publishers do that, that it would eat up a lot of their time. So I don't think it eats up enough of somebody's time uh, to do that. So I, I don't think it has a real impact. That, that, that's, just, that's just my kind of first blush at that. So that, that's my thoughts. Okay, next one is you mentioned a couple of times that you don't like top 10 lists because they tend to be ephemeral. Truth be told, when I got into the hobby, your top 10s helped me a lot in deciding which games to seek out, especially after I realized that our opinions tend to be more or less aligned. When you consider, would you consider doing these again as another way of providing public service to the hobby? Uh, I think I've said that I don't like top 10 lists because of the top 10 part, because of the order. Because I don't think the order, the order doesn't really matter to me. Uh, your number one versus your number two, who cares? I know. I don't care, <laughs> but I do agree with what you said there. And I have said before that like top tens or top 100s are great when you come into the hobby and you're like, okay, I, you know, I've had that spark. I want to check out more games. Uh, you, how do I do that? And so if I go watch Tom Vassell's top 100, he gives me a hundred games and he talks about them for like two minutes each. And then now after I've watched that, I have a list of games I want to go research. And so the same with top tens. Uh, so I think that's, that's why they're good. And I think that uh, definitely I would agree that they're good for that. I just don't, I just have said I don't like the order of it because it doesn't matter. The number one game, that's a dumb thing. Like somebody winning an Oscar or Grammy for music, that's also stupid. Okay. <laughs> um, but will I do more? Yeah, I'll probably do more. Uh, next question. How does your family feel about you dedicating so much time to doing uh, reviews um they are supportive of it uh they i'm trying to think of a time there's been a conflict or a clash over it i'm sure there has but it was not really related to doing the reviews um i try to keep it to where i'm when i do the recording and stuff like that i when there's nobody home so like if my wife's at work and my son is doing something else after school or something like that you know i try to keep it to those times uh, where I'm not doing it while when I could be with them, that kind of thing. Um, but I will like edit videos and stuff if it's late at night and we're all kind of off in our own rooms doing our own thing. I'll just be editing the video, but I can always just stop that immediately and attend to whatever needs to be attended to. So uh, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been good. I mean, it hasn't really been any conflict regarding the reviews at all. Next question. You mentioned a few times that you grew up in California. How did you end up in Idaho? What's the story? Okay, that's a long one. Let's see how long it takes me to answer that. We're not too, we're just a little bit over. If I can keep this under 90 minutes, I'll finish this because there's a few more questions. Let's go. So yeah, I grew up in California. And then let's see, when I graduated high school, I moved from Southern California to Oakland, California, which is across the bay from San Francisco. And at that moment, my parents and my brother moved to Idaho. So I stayed in Oakland, and I went to college there for three years. I went to art school. Uh, I was a painter. You can imagine maybe that's why I like painting minis. Anyway, so I stayed there for a little bit, and I was getting my art degree. The plan was to keep doing art and then also uh, as sort of the job side of that because it's very hard to just be a painter and work, right? So I was going to do art education. So... After three years of art school, I was sort of looking to start migrating to getting my education certification, my degree in that. Uh, so it turns out that the University of Idaho, which is about an hour and a half from where I live now, um, you know, we had a good school. And my parents had been up in Idaho for three years. And so I had uh, sort of a grandfathered in residency. So then I went up to there, and it took me two years there uh, to finish up uh, the education part of my schooling. I did all my art stuff. I think I took one, yeah, took one drawing class. For some reason, they didn't transfer <laughs> all of the art that I've been doing nonstop. So they're like, "Oh, you still got to take a drawing class," and I was like, "All right, whatever. I mean, it's drawing. I like it." So I did some drawing class, and then uh, so I did that. And then actually lived in Seattle for about six months uh, doing my like my internship. And then I had to take a speech class at a community college while I was over there doing uh, teaching. I was teaching uh, junior high uh, art over there for half a year. And so once I was done with that, 
I was done with school. So I had an art education degree. So I was certified uh, K through 12 art. And then I started looking for a job and I found one job opening that uh, contacted me back that was in Michigan outside Detroit. I was like, oh, really? I'll move over to Detroit all by myself. I don't think that sounds super fun. Um, but so I'd also, through the course of my education, uh, this all happened sort of at the beginnings of the dot-com bubble in the 90s. So I had been taking some classes in uh, HTML and started to learn like JavaScript and Java even and that kind of stuff. And so I started just kind of looking for work uh, around just looking for work and I had some friends here that I through my brother and stuff they were into computers and they were in IT and stuff and so I got a job over here in the valley and uh, started just doing HTML you know for people and uh, learning Java and JavaScript because I needed a job and it was funny because like the job I got was like an entry-level job and I was already making more than I'd make if I was a teacher for a few years you know that like whole heart depressing soul crushing society is upside down <laughs> feeling. Yeah. So yeah. So I did that and then basically got sucked in and now I'm like a principal senior software engineer at a company. <laughs> so yeah, that's how that works. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole, I got more, more there, but that's all I'm going to go. Uh, so that's that. Uh, and next question, how does it feel to be the lead designer and owner of walking fish games? Uh, so yeah, so I have, uh, there's a there's an actual publisher on Board Game Geek called Walking Fish Games. That's me. Um, I, like I said before, I have like two designs I've kicked around and stuff. And I, I created that because I wasn't sure like, well, let's say I did this, something with this. Would I want it to be drive-through games or what? Or Walking Fish Games? So I was like, do I keep the brand? Do I move on to another brand and pump that if I did that? You know, whatever. So I, all I did was create that and then... Um, we uh, a buddy of mine kind of helped me with graphic design and stuff uh, years ago. He's a kind of a marketing internet guy, you know. That's like his job. So we just kicked around the idea, and he created this little logo for me because I like the idea of that. There's a fish. There's a, literally a fish. If you go to the Walking Fish Games, he made this cool logo. And it's a fish that walks. It's a fish with legs and feet. And I always thought that was like a cool image, you know, because it's sort of like there's like some evolution in there and there's some weird alien looking thing. And it's a fish <laughs> with legs, you know, it looks like a Murloc sort of from Warcraft anyway. So I don't know how it feels. Um, but that's just there kind of in my back pocket for now. If I ever do anything with that, uh, next question. Let's see. I answered that on the forums. Yep. I think we're just going to cruise out. There's just a handful of questions here and that'll finish them up. Uh, it says I've heard several reviewers talk about having a camera persona an on camera persona what are your thoughts on this? And would you agree at all with the sentiment? I'd say yes and no. Yes to an extent because like I won't curse on a video or on the podcast. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, I have before, but it's hopefully discreetly. I definitely curse more in person and in during games <laughs> than, you know, on camera. But I'm also trying to be sort of polite and uh, not you know, be too trashy or anything, be something where hopefully like a, if somebody's watching a video review with the kids or something, they could watch it without fear. But like, I don't also curse around my own kids and at work and stuff like that either. So it's just, and it's an aspect of my personality. I wouldn't say it's a completely different uh, persona because it's still me telling you how I feel and stuff. Um, and there's just sort of a, you know, there's things are in degrees is all. Next one. It was interesting to hear you talk about compare talk about and compare reviewer versus a critic what is your thoughts about a critical analysis of a game where the mechanics are sort of laid bare well, with a potential eye towards genealogy so i think you think you maybe it's let's say you talk about something that has worker placement and then comparing i'd say a new game with worker placement like let's say way of the panda and kind of working it back to like agricola and calis and other games that use that I don't know. I'd say listen to Ludology. Uh, because if I, yeah, I mean, if I ever did it, I would just be like, oh, wait, I think Ludology did an episode on this and just go listen to it and be like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say that's cool. I think it's more of a design thing than a fun thing or a reviewer thing. I don't know. I think it's worth doing. I don't know that I'd I'd be that into doing that. Maybe, though. I think, I think if you caught me in a few years ago, I might have been interested in doing that a little bit more. Um, but definitely Ludology is your, your, huckle, your Huckleberry there if you want that kind of thing. They do a fantastic 
fantastic job of just they, they're like the science of fun that's kind of what the science of, of tabletop fun that that podcast and they do it in a way that's not stiff and boring or anything they do it with enthusiasm and and fun and silliness and but also a lot of brains and everything uh so yeah next one is there a chance that you lance and marco will get together for a podcast episode in the future um uh, maybe I don't know. There's no, we haven't, none of us have brought it up with the other, uh, in this, in years. So I still speak to Lance and I still speak to Marco relatively frequently, mostly like on Facebook, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I think that might be fun. I have to figure out something to talk about. Just do it like as a one-off or something, but I think, I don't know, like I'm more interested in, this is weird. Like I would be more interested in Lance telling me about like his life and his kids and you know how he's working for tasty mentral you know what you know kind of now he's on the other side of the coin how that's going you know and all that kind of stuff and just generally talk about like random stuff like game of thrones or movies that are out and uh with marco with the same thing you know how his daughters are doing and and uh, all that stuff and how school's going and and then probably eventually Marco and I would talk politics. <laughs> Maybe Lance too, but but nobody wants to hear me and Marco talk politics. <laughs> anyway, that's that. But yeah, maybe. I'll have to figure something out and try to keep us from talking about anything that might piss people off. Uh, let's see. Off-topic question. Is Whispers Red still your favorite ASMR artist? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, ASMR, what does that stand for? Let me look it up. ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. So in case everybody doesn't know what the heck we're talking about. So let me give you a history about this. So somebody uploaded a video one time to YouTube. This was years ago, maybe 10 years ago or more. And it was just black. There was no video really. And it was just of her whispering. And it was kind of this thing where, okay, so this happens to me when I go to uh, the barbershop to get my hair cut. And you get like this, they'll be cutting my hair, whatever, giving me shampoo. And this like tingly feeling will start in the very top of my brain. And then it just kind of like a very calming, like just a relaxing, not like a weird, creepy feeling or anything. It's just like a relaxation kind of thing, a meditation kind of thing. And so this gal uploaded this video of whispering, which I hadn't experienced this part of it, but so they did it. And then it, it that same thing will trigger that same sort of calming, like it's a, it's a tingly feeling for sure. So it's a calming kind of thing. So from that video, and it's a scientific term now because they've now coined it. There's studies on it and all the stuff. So it's sort of sprung out this little cottage industry of ASMR artists on YouTube that do different things. And they'll do just, they'll just whisper or they'll like crinkle paper, which I sort of can't stand that, but, or they'll tap things like they'll, you know, they'll tap things. Let me tap the mic a little bit. See, I don't know if that's hurting you or not. But, you know, you, you talk and you whisper in a very low voice. <laughs> and I know some of you are like getting the heapy cheapies right now. But, yeah, so you do that, and then they'll do certain things where they, they will do things where, like, they're paying attention to you. So they're, like, uh, taking notes. They're admitting you into a doctor's office, or they're a doctor giving you a medical exam. I mean, they get real fancy now with all this stuff. Um, but, yeah, Whispers Red is great. Uh, I think her and uh, Olivia Kisper are the two and there's another one, Sophie something or other. I like her too. Um, but it's just, it's certain artists that will sort of trigger with somebody. Because there'll be others that I've watched and I'm like, this is nothing. Or this is creepy or gross. Uh, you know, I don't know what it is. It's certain things will sort of like line up with you. And it's great for like falling asleep. Like if I'm really fired up or something. And, uh, you know, it's like it, it's a midnight. And I'm like, I need to go to bed. But I'm all fired up. I'll put that on and like, man, within like two minutes... I'm like, whew, I'm relaxed and I go to bed and I'll go to sleep. Or I'll put it on at work uh, while I'm programming because I, you know, write code and stuff. And sometimes I write like, you know, really heavy, fast music or something to get me going. Uh, or this will put me on and sort of calm me down a little bit. It's just kind of, you know, put me in a different mind frame. Uh, but I say Whispers Red or Olivia is probably my favorite. Olivia, Olivia's, I would say, more creative. I think she's like the most creative that I've seen. Um, but Whispers is, is, it's my favorite because I like her because she she gives you the impression anyway that she legitimately cares about people that watch her video and again the whole like mental well-being like she does it for that and I'm like that's cool she's kind of like a, like a doctor almost so yeah there you go uh, let's see last couple 
Oh, yes, yeah, Christopher. I've spoken to Christopher a few times. Uh, so he says, I would love to hear your opinion on things, maybe a short segment at the end on pop culture, like your taste in music, art, or other hobby-esque endeavors. I was doing that for a while on the podcast. I would kind of do this bonus random bit, um, but the last couple I haven't. So, yeah, I can... I don't know. I don't know how many people would be interested in that. Maybe people can let me know. I'm always happy to talk about it if people ping me on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, too. The next one is... Um, oh, I see. If you dabble in art, I believe you do, and music yourself, I would like to hear about it. You are willing to share something so personal. Um, you know, I had guitars in my other room, and I haven't picked up a guitar in years, and it's a little bit sad. Uh, I used to play guitar all the time, hours every day. I don't know. I just feel like I grew out of that, I guess. Not like, I don't know. But I still will make a painting or a drawing now and then. Uh, but not too often. The, the miniature painting is sort of eaten that up, and it has the bonus of being artistic and colorful and and creative and also helping out with the gaming. <laughs> so the miniature painting has really eaten up that time. Let's see. You may have addressed this before. What is your take on Kiss Kickstarter? And it's impact, nay or yay, in the hobby. It's longevity, your opinion on large companies like Asmodee acquiring small companies. Oh, that's a very good question. And uh, funnily enough, I talked about this on that DLC podcast uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. I think Kickstarter is great. And I think it's especially great now because Asmodee is buying up all these companies. And we have these sort of large conglomerate type of things. You've got Asmodee, you got Games Workshop, you've got Hasbro slash Wizards of the Coast. And then you have a couple of small ones, you know, you got like Stronghold and Osprey and uh, other companies that use Kickstarter. Uh, the great thing about the big companies like Asmodee and Hasbro and stuff is they're able to get out a large number of product, put a lot of marketing behind it, throw it into stores like Walmart and Target and those kind of big box stores. And that should hopefully kind of spread the hobby more generally or more broadly, get to the new folks uh, better. So that's great. Uh, but there's going to be a certain amount of, let's say a certain amount of just sort of homogenization with that kind of thing. You know, that they, you have to be a little bit safer, that kind of thing. Um, you know, a little bit more uh, entry level, maybe a certain, you know, safer themes, that kind of stuff. But the nice thing about Kickstarter is that it's geared really for board games. I mean, more than any other thing, more than movies and video games and all these other things. Kickstarter is perfect for board games because you can go quickly from idea, design, get some art, get some funding, bam, you make you know 3,000 to 5,000 copies or whatever if you get really successful. Uh, so I think that's great for, uh, and it's a little bit, I guess, more democratic of a, of a marketplace because if they get the funding, then great. If you overfund, then you can bling out the game and all that. And so it's a perfect vehicle for a group of individuals who can get together and get their act together and organize and put out, you know, new stuff that is maybe a little different or off, uh, you know, off of the norm. So I think that, I think those two things actually kind of work hand in hand. So I'm actually, I don't mind, you know, as when they can buy people up all they want, guess what? The other side of the coin can all just throw their stuff on Kickstarter and, you know, generate uh, income that way and, you know, bring games out that way. Let's see. Uh, two more questions. This is this other one's sort of a group one. Your favorite publishers, game designers, artists. Well, publishers I mentioned, Osprey is really at the top now. Uh, game designers, I would say Stefan Fell still up there. I'm still excited to see what he comes out with. Uh, Eric Lang, Eric Lang has has gotten gotten better with me. You know, I was kind of like at a 50-50 with him, but between Blood Rage, uh, Rising Sun, and The Godfather, that kind of trilogy, they're almost like a trilogy of games. Uh, really enjoyed those games. You know, Knizia, I still like some of his older stuff, obviously. There's a lot of old games of his that I still play. Uh, Martin Wallace, for sure. I still got a handful of his games in my collection. I think the folks at Gale Force 9 do wonderful things uh, with those weird off-the-wall IPs like Sons of Anarchy and Homeland. And, uh, you know, they have that uh, Doctor Who game. I haven't played that one, yet, but, uh, you know, I like that sort of school of thought. Uh, but I think Feld's still up there as far as the designer goes. And uh, otherwise, it's mostly kind of one-offs, though, the rest of my collection. Uh, but Feld, I probably have the most of, and Martin Wallace, and then Eric Lang. Uh, artists, though, oh, man. There's so many really good artists. A lot of them don't get their sort of names in, in, uh, in, in the headlines, so to speak, as, 
as most of the designers do. I don't know. The art's such a tricky thing because I'm looking at my shelf now and I'm looking at uh, the, you know, Blood Rage and Rising Sun. So that's Adrian Smith and he's a big Warhammer artist. Does these great, let's just call them adolescent illustrations. And I really, I really do dig that. But if I look also at Fog of Love and the sort of uh, delicate kind of graphic design involved there, I love that too. It's just, uh, let's see. Well, Adam McIver, I, I, I've worked with him before, so caveat there, but I really like his his art style. He's got a very cool kind of illustrative style that's not super cartoony. Uh, Eno Tool, I like his stuff. Uh, he's he does he does like a lot of the Vital Lacerda games. Uh, Adam McIver, he did uh, Ex Libris. I didn't really like that game, but I like the art and stuff in that. Oh well, Beth Sobel is also one that I like as well. Like she did Lanterns which is really cool. It's just very abstract, colorful shapes, but then she also did Viticulture. And, uh, well, I don't know if she did everything in Viticulture, but she did some stuff in there, like she did the cover to Path of Light and Shadows. So, yeah, so she's another good one as well. I mean, I wish I knew more about artists, but I'm also like, you know, like I talk about Oscars and Grammys and stuff. And that's different, I guess. That's I'm just being talking more about recognition right now. But that's a handful of people. And then the last question... From, also from Christopher is, are you going to pack some plug? No, <laughs> unfortunately I'm not. I'm only going to Gen Con this year. I went to a bunch of cons last year and too many probably sort of burnt out on it. Uh, definitely going to Gen Con because it's been a couple years now since I've been there. So I'm excited to go back and check it out. Uh, but that's the only thing I'm going to in the foreseeable future. So that is all the questions and thanks to everybody that sent them in and uh, thanks to Andrew and everybody else that entered in the contest and Andrew I'll be in contact with you uh, regarding uh, Rising Sun and I, I guess I, I put notes here but we went a little bit long but I'll make a mention of it anyway is like my kind of bonus random segment is going to be Gaslands which is from Osprey Games and they just sent me the book to that and what this is I haven't got into it yet but I'm super excited because Jamie at the Secret Cabal has got me so fired up about this game. It is just a little book, it costs like, let me see, what's the cover price here? It says $19, but I'm sure you can find it for like 15 bucks on Amazon or somewhere else. It uh, It's a, a set of rules for using Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars as a miniature game. Uh, it's sort of like playing X-Wing, but a little bit more going on with, in terms of the core mechanics than X-Wing. It has cool like dice rolling shifting thing. So it seems awesome. So I've I'm joined the Gaslands Facebook page and everybody's like painting up and like beating the crap out of their Hot Wheels and making them look all like uh, Mad Max wasteland cars and adding little guns and stuff on them and you know sanding them down and making the cards look all beat up and everything. And I've watched some videos on it and Jamie's told me about it. So I'm super excited to like go to the dollar store or something and grab like 50 Hot Wheels and then uh, you know glue on little Necromunda and Warhammer 40k guns and stuff like that and paint them up and beat them up and then uh, try to play some games with it. But I'm super excited about that uh, game coming up here in the future. Anyway, so that is this month's episode of Drive Through FM. Thank you, everybody, again, for listening and watching and all that stuff. And uh, definitely take care of yourselves and have a good April. Okay, bye.